Purple Heart Homes presents Putting the Pieces Back Together, a forum for veterans and the community to connect. Here are your hosts, veterans John Galena and Brad Borders. Lucy, I'm home. There's about to be a fight up in here. Ain't going to be you, no fight up in here. Look here, Ricky. You, you better get in line. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to explain something to you. <laughs> That's what I learned while I was yeah. in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, I'm going to get I'm gonna get you a ticket back there, right? You gone for a as month. Long, you as come long back as in Devin here. ain't going with me, I'm good. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Shots uh, fired. Welcome to uh, putting the pieces back together. We're trying to put everything back together after John's hiatus on the secret mission far away. Well, if y'all wouldn't have broken it all while I was gone. Uh, I don't know. Ratings went up while you were gone, so uh, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Is right? that right? Watch them plummet today. All so, right. uh, uh, <laughs> so hey, welcome to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. We are a 501c3 out of Statesville, North Carolina. We seek to solve uh, veteran housing issues through safety and accessibility renovations, uh, manufacturing tiny homes, and uh, trying to do our best to solve problems for those who have served our country. And uh, we're really grateful to be able to do that. We're grateful that you're listening today. Um, it is a um, it is the 79th anniversary of D-Day today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I heard, it's hard to celebrate such a somber day. Well, I took place. I heard a great story this morning from a sister radio we, show. We've already heard it three on, times. On Woody Wilcox. <laughs> and heard so it once live and you, twice repeated by Brad. If you haven't heard this, so the the oh, on the gosh. celebration of D-Day. <laughs> On the celebration of D-Day, the, the greatest airborne operation of all time and the invasion and the liberation of Europe, um, the United States government has now commenced with an airborne operation on the island of Guam to eradicate snakes, brown tree snakes, from the, they're an invasive species that is eating uh, rare birds there, right? This is a true story. And so the U.S. government spent $8 million to parachute mice into Guam that are filled, they're fed Tylenol, and they parachute them in, these little cardboard parachutes, so that the snakes will eat the mice, and evidently the snakes are allergic to Tylenol, and it's going to kill them. I just so, don't know how they found out the snakes were allergic to Tylenol. Yeah, Did yeah, they I have a know. headache? Oh, Did somebody try and stomp it with their heel? I have no <laughs> that idea. That just didn't work? I just know that the, the greatest air, on the celebration of the greatest airborne operation of all time, this year we are celebrating airborne operation of little mice underneath cardboard parachutes yeah, to so, eradicate you know, snakes I'd, from I'd the I'd much rather Guam. talk about the artillery. Yeah. You should have shot the mice <laughs> in through artillery shells. Yeah, it's Sabo <laughs> round filled with, uh, filled with mice. Yeah. So, and when they explode, mice just run everywhere, and then the snakes are gone, and everybody can return. Ev evidently, the snakes are, it was something like 13,000 snakes per acre. That is so, just unbelievable. Yes, it's just like <laughs> okay. it's Tammy's worst nightmare. Oh my god! Yeah, and mice and snakes, right? <laughs> it's like a, it's her worst nightmare. So, so in honor of D Day, we got we got just some really great stuff going on today. Uh, certainly, we got a fantastic guest, and I'm I'm really curious. Uh, we got the famous Pat Shannon, best guest of all time, uh, on on the show with us today. Pat, have you ever sat in that chair? You know, I haven't. This is the first time I've sat in yeah. this chair. I mean, when you so. came in, I thought you were just going to get right behind the board and just start really? uh, start going away. No, that's Isaiah's job. Okay. He does a great job at that. He, Isaiah's Isaiah's does Isaiah does do a great job. He does. Course. He does a yeah. great job. Yeah. Well, well, welcome to the this show. This is kind of unique. It's small over here. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm getting larger. One. <laughs> I find it's really small. Nobody yeah. puts Pat in the corner. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But uh, before we get started, I, I thought, um, you know, about the show today and being uh, the 79th anniversary of D-Day, as Brad said, uh, certainly something uh, we never want to forget. And, you know, this uh, whole idea of what those uh, men were, were doing and why they were doing it. But I think there's some unique stories that, that are often not told. And I've been uh, reading a book here, uh, Facing the Mountain, that was recommended to me by Brian Sohovich here recently. And uh, just as we were talking about service, and I had never really learned or studied about the Japanese Americans and the, in particular the uh, 522nd uh, which is an artillery unit Brad oh my gosh. that uh, served uh, all <laughs> across uh, Europe and, uh, and basically they were, they were one of the most revered 
fighting forces that America had deployed. Because they were artillery? Uh, no, not because they oh. were artillery, but particularly <laughs> because of their just their their dedication mm. and and their commitment to fight and bring honor to their families, as their families were in concentration camps yeah. in America, while they were fighting a war for freedom and they were truly truly fighting for their own freedom and and so a couple of uh, things that i thought were were kind of stood out in the book and before we get to pat i just want to call out because i think they they referenced to some of the challenges we face today in our military with post-traumatic stress with people having clarity and understanding of what it's about to serve and, and really what war is like. And so I'm just going to read a couple of little pieces out of this. Uh, this is uh, from June 25th, and it says uh, they clambered out of their trucks and marched 15 miles up narrow, winding roads into the hills and closing in on the front lines as artillery shells uh, regularly whistled over their heads, fired from somewhere in the rear, their divisional artillery trying to soften up whatever lay ahead in the hills. And then it goes on to say, just kind of paraphrasing, uh, it goes on to say, uh, whether they were religious or not, whether they were Buddhist, Christian, or Shinto, or none of the above, whether they had ever prayed in their lives, they prayed now as the earth trembled and flashes of light lit up in the hills ahead. In the morning, they were to attack. And then it it goes on to say, Few of them slept that night despite the long hike. Mostly they lay on the cold ground looking up into the stars and wondering what it would be like. But the wondering was fruitless. They couldn't really know. They couldn't know that they were about to see things and to do things. That would change them utterly. Things they would regret. Things that would sear their soul. And things they would cherish beyond all reckoning. Mm. They couldn't yet understand that they were about to step off the edge of the world. Mm -hmm. How true Mm -hmm. is that? That we often don't think about, you know, what you face in that imminent moment, knowing what you're about to enter into. And there's so many great stories in this book, and I I could literally spend an hour going through it. And there's a couple of chaplains that are um, followed through the book, and I shared with, uh, with Brad, being a, a chaplain, this one particular story that I found very interesting as the chaplains were about to enter into the battlefield to go uh, retrieve some of the wounded and, and killed. Mm-hmm. And in the process, one of the chaplains was inter- injured with shrapnel, and he took uh, six pieces of shrapnel across his uh, side, his back, and his butt. <laughs> and in the process of making his way back to the front line, <laughs> He jumps on a bicycle with a wound on his butt My and man. rides his bicycle back to the front you, line. Bicycles and it, won the it war. reminded me yeah. of Brad. I was like, I wonder if this is where Brad learned to ride a bike. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's how we won the war. Is that Bicycles, a part of chaplain right? training? That is. That's part of chaplain training. So that's awesome, so, man. Um, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, you know, we just think about uh, military service and we think about today's soldiers. And we think about today's airmen, we oftentimes forget about those that led the way and went before us. And, and it's just it's something that we can't do. You know, we, we have to remember those that uh, have served in sacrifice. And, and we've got a uh, veteran in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, that turns 100 this week. Mm-hmm. And uh, World War II vet. Yep. And, you know, we just we can't forget those men they are still out there yeah and, if you were, and so many families that serve to support the effort too yeah if you're a if you're a veteran listening and uh perhaps you served in world war ii uh and you're listening thank you for your service uh and then many of our listeners um, have family members that served in world war ii that are no longer with us um the way we uh, um honor and um protect that memory is by celebrating in a somber way, you know, days like today, Memorial Day and things like that. And so uh, uh, we're really grateful and um, grateful for that generation that came home from that war and and, uh, and built our country into what it is. So uh, um, make a have a, a memorable D-Day today. Yeah. So and, and just for the record, um, the uh, 30th Division did, in fact, <laughs> land on D-Day plus five at Omaha record. Beach. Just well, got to make sure I throw that in there for all our uh, 30th uh, listeners out there. Couldn't go, on, couldn't go on day one. Had to go on day five. Well, that's right. Yeah. It, it was. They, it would have just run everybody off if they would have showed up on day one. That's right. One. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't yeah, have been epic. Run, right? Yeah, everybody would have yeah. just run for their lives. All the Germans just going, oh, my gosh, it's the 30th Division. What are we going to do? 
Yeah. Well, back then they were known as Roosevelt's SS. Yeah, so, I don't you know. even know if I'd go there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to our Please. our guest, Pat Shannon. Uh, you know, Pat, I remember one of the one of the early conversations we had uh, when when Brad and I first started the show here. I had uh, actually I said, so uh, Pat, you served in the Army Air Corps, yeah. and you were like. Uh, John, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> John was thinking Pat was like flying biplanes and and uh, shooting at the Red Baron. Right? I, d- I did try to enlist, but I was five years old. Yeah, the there you go. The, uh, there you go. So well, welcome, Air Force. welcome to the show, Pat. Shannon. Thank you very much, Brad. So John? for the, those that yeah. don't know, Pat Shannon Kevin? is Kevin? a local well, legend here. Um, Pat uh, had a, 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 a show on WSIC for. 40 years now, <laughs> and uh, so it doesn't seem like that long. Seems but, a lot longer for a lot of yeah, people. I used to, I would listen to Pat when I was a young fella, right? <laughs> In fact, let me let me interject this about you, Brad Borders, Wayne Rogers, whom we both know. That's right. Shout when, out to Wayne. When, <laughs> when, when you were so-called working with Tar, tar, tar Heel Lumber, and I, I'd already... Wait a minute, you said so-called working? So-called. Has, that, so been a, has that been a lifelong kind of thing? Yeah. Is that, I know Wayne was trying to figure out really what it is Brad was doing. <laughs> Can you time. give me Wayne's phone number? Well, he, he called his dad, you know, and said, Jack, what is Brad supposed to be doing here at Tar Hill? And we could never figure it out. I mean, I, would, I had already retired. <laughs> But but one thing was sure, this guy's never going to be a chaplain. Thank God he made his handy mortars. No way. Wayne Rogers had a had a say, and he would pull me up to the uh, big. We had a big plate glass window at yep. Tar Heel Lumber Company, and we could look out into the warehouse. He said, "Let me show you something. Look out there. What do you see?" And there was a bunch of guys out there driving forklifts and moving around. Yep. I said, uh, I see guys working. He said, you know what I see? I see a lot of activity, but I don't see any productivity. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That was his legendary. That was Wayne. Wayne had uh, a lot of legend. I've got a lot of Wayne Rogers stories. I won't tell them all today. But, uh, Wayne, we love you, brother. Yeah. So, so, so Pat, you were, you were sharing <clears throat> your – where were you born? Where are you from? Well, originally Monroe, North Carolina, which was at the time during World War II. It, the, the war was about the World War II was about a year in when I was hatched. And <laughs> Camp Sutton was a pretty large military installation there. Monroe was a was a big railroad mm. town at the time, 20 miles south of Charlotte, or east of Charlotte. And uh, my dad was chief of police at that time, so it kept him pretty busy. Yeah. And it was also a POW for Italian POWs there. That, oh, wow. In fact, North Carolina had many German camps, POW camps. And uh, Camp Sutton was one of the POW camps there. Then um, <clears throat> my dad wound up going with the prison department. We wound up uh, temporarily in Henderson, North Carolina, then came to Statesville here in 52, 51 mm-hmm. or 52, yeah. something like that, 52. And, and been here ever since and stuff. Wow. And uh, well, my sister, by the way, was in the Air Force. She joined in 19, when women weren't really joining that much. I th- and Jane, if you're listening, if I get the date wrong, I think it was 1949 she joined. And all they still had the, the WAC uniforms for the for the WAF as they were called. Each service said that uh, women had their own uh, nomenclature there for their names. But anyway, she uh, had some great stories she would tell about that. Met her husband, who was an Air Force flight engineer, and they married. And then at that time when she became pregnant, she uh, got out of the Air Force, but still considered herself a. Uh, a veteran, which he should. Awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We, quite a we like are it. really looking forward to uh, digging into uh, your service here. And I know Brad's got uh, three pages of notes and questions. And so we got a lot to get through <laughs> and unpack. Uh, but we're uh, coming up on a break here. And uh, just before we go to the break, you were telling us your dad was in the service. Yes. And just very mm-hmm. briefly, we got about yeah. 30 seconds before break. What? Tell us a little bit about that. He was a pilot. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was in the cavalry, and they'd have him. We put a pilot over there, you know, <laughs> the pilot over there. No, actually, he was he was in the cavalry. He was a farrier, and would uh, shoot horses and break horses That's at awesome. Fort Sam Houston, and and uh, had quite a year there. All That's right, cool. We're gonna go to break. We'll be back here in about three minutes, and we'll have the project of the week with Double Dog Devin. You are listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. 
right, we are back here live, putting the pieces back together, presented by Purple Heart Homes, and we've got special guest Pat Shannon with us today, and before we get back to Pat and his stories, we want to hear from Devil Dog Devin and his exploits as he has been traveling (laughs) the world to uh, serve veterans and set up chapters. Exploits. Great story. Exploits, huh? (laughs) Oh, there's plenty of them, with lots of explicit, how do you say that? Explicit? Explicitives. Oh, explicitives. Th- yeah, those were all good. coming yeah. from John as I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> or in other words, you could say colorful metaphors. <laughs> colorful metaphors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's there was a lot of accurate. those. Yeah. Yeah. You know what you know what I found most interesting is, you know, all around the world there's this there's this sign. It's it's red and it's octagon shape, <laughs> but it has different four letter words <laughs> on it. <laughs> and and in and, and, and in Puerto Rico, uh, it says P A R E, right? Pear. Yeah, right. And for whatever reason, while he thought you Devil Dog take a skin is driving, off an apple or something, yeah, no, no, he no, he ignored these signs. <laughs> every single one of them, like almost Pear, killed that, me that multiple times. No, that right. means two. There was two of us in the vehicle. We yeah, get to go that way. You <laughs> can't. <laughs> and Devin, <laughs> please stop. He's like, but it's an interstate. I'm like, I don't care. It's a stop sign. Stop. He's like, that was a stop sign. Yeah, he can't spell either. <laughs> <laughs> can't spell, oh, yeah, can't, can't read. He's, he, you know what? Can't he's, a, he's a normal Marine. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> thank, thank good Lord that uh, Purple Heart Holmes took pity on me and gave me a job. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. That, yeah, what you're helping do. veterans, <laughs> one veteran at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right, uh, Devil Dog, talk yeah, to us about your project yeah, of the week. Speaking of veterans, yeah, let's talk about uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, both John and I got a chance to hear uh, uh, an Air Force veteran, David, speak uh, at, at uh, Memorial Day celebration. And David was just so grateful. Uh, we're currently in the process of helping him uh, build, build a, a small home in, in Puerto Rico on, on his family's property. And um one of the things that was most impactful for me is as we're listening to David, he, he's talking about how how amazing it was go, to go from a two man tent to a four man tent, mm. and I was like, wow. How, well, why didn't he have a home? Well, uh, he's just he he's a uh, Hurricane Maria. Hur, Hurricane Maria uh, took out took out his 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 home, um, and that and was not his wife. That was not uh, 2000. Uh, <laughs> it was 2018, I believe, uh, is when that happened. And uh, typically, they, those things would recover a lot quicker. COVID happened, and, and nobody went down there and helped those folks. Mm. You know, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. Um, it's part of the U.S., and we often forget about our veterans down there. Um, and something that that David after. All, everybody was done speaking. The ceremony was over. He come to me, and he's put his hands on my shoulder. And he said, will you just tell them to stop? I, I don't need new windows. My, my neighbor's got some old used ones, and, and mm. I don't need a new refrigerator. My, that, that old one works just mm. fine. Mm. I, I, don't, I, I didn't serve during war. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Cold War veteran. It, mm. it, I, I don't deserve this. That, mm. That's what he told me, yeah. it, that he didn't deserve it. And um, the fact is, is... Is whether you serve during peacetime or wartime, you had a commitment and a willingness to serve your country, mm-hmm. and and he did, and he has disabilities from that. He can't hear her, uh, when there's background noise. Um, he he's no less deserving than any of our other veterans. So, David, if you're out there listening, hey, thank you for your service, brother. Awesome. Thanks, hey, just some Appreciate some it. great people, mm-hmm. great partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of service uh, members have come out of Puerto Rico. Over 200,000 uh, service members, current veterans, currently live in uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, just a great pride for their service and I their served with uh, I served with a, the, an, almost an entire unit from Puerto Rico uh, in Iraq. They were they were wow. stationed at the base that I mainly st- stayed at, and um, they were uh, I, they they were all almost completely. Spanish speakers only, mm. and so and they were they they were the mayor's cell. Do you remember the mayor's oh, cell? Yeah. At the yeah. And so basically, the mayor's cell take care of all the infrastructure on the on the base. And so sometimes it was a challenge to try to get stuff 
to try to, you know, for those well, of us that who don't, that I'm was not bilingual. the Army's plan, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One more barrier to yeah, get that's the right. two yeah. by four. Yeah, that's right. We just needed, and, and my colonel, he was always wanting to build things. And so, uh, but they were, they were great people. And uh, uh, we were really excited about, uh, about serving with them. And so uh, that's awesome. I'm glad you guys had the opportunity to go that's down there. So what most people, I, I don't know that they're aware about Pat Shannon, is he was a radio broadcaster, and we found a little clip here uh, as what it makes me think of to be a military uh, radio broadcaster. Awesome. Isaiah? Good morning, Vietnam! <laughs> <laughs> Pat, is that hey, how you open Cornell your show? <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your time as a broadcaster in the Air Force. Well, it covers quite a lot of time. But uh, actually, the AFSC, or MOS, as you Army guys call it, Air Force Specialty Code, I was identified as a radio and TV broadcast specialist, highly trained. Yes. And uh, went through school at uh, Fort uh, uh, Slocum, which is no longer there, right, right outside of New Rochelle, New York, and uh, trained us in the... Uh, peculiarities of, of broadcasting overseas because we had in uh, country host country sensitivities we had to be aware of like certain things you couldn't see right. like for instance when I was in Taiwan I spent two tours there Taipei and Tainan we couldn't play because of the situation of the island red sails in the sunset <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by, by you know, fast phenomena <laughs> right. seriously because they said well it's you know it's because uh, the sunset over mainland China Right. And if you see red sails, yeah, get that thing. Yeah, so there were even sensitivities back then. Wow, <laughs> but uh, it's crazy. it was great. I mean, it was uh, something that I just felt really uh, honored to be able to do. And and uh, I mean, I would rather have been a jet fighter pilot or something, the Tom Cruise type type of right. guy, a Top Gun or something. But I was a broadcaster. You were the maverick of the red. I was the maverick of the. <laughs> <laughs> and and when you look at uh, Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams. Even Adrian Cronauer says that was Robin Williams. I mean, those of us, I mean, sure, we did things. It was easier to ask forgiveness than permission right. on a lot of stuff there. Uh, but uh, the, the movie was a lot about him, but a lot of it was true because we were there to, to help keep the morale up, to make it as much for the guy serving in Vietnam or uh, Korea, as much like home as we could. Yeah, you know, sure. people would call it, hey, can you play such yeah. and such, sure, we'll, we'll get it for you. Did you Dedicated. cross paths with uh, Adrian Cronauer? No, you? no, I, I yeah. actually was there before he, he showed up. I okay. was in Vietnam in 65. Yeah. Actually, a few dependents were still hanging around then, so it wasn't the hostilities. We did have the radio station bombed, uh, okay. which we had one in Saigon there, and uh, the Brink Hotel is where we were located. Bob Hope was coming through. He was scheduled <laughs> to stay there. And they had to route him to some other quarters. And when he was doing his show, he said it's the first time he's ever ha had a hotel pass him by. <laughs> oh my gosh. But uh, we were off the air like 30 minutes when that was it. We were back on the air. But the, uh, anyway, I've got like, I know this is about transitioning, putting the pieces back together. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, when, when you look at my career, I mean, it was basically one of the most enjoyable plush type of assignments you could have in like Taiwan, Germany, Korea, in times where the hostilities weren't that bad, even Vietnam, Guam, except right. for the rat snakes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but and the parachuting mice. Mickey Mouse. Yeah. You know how they got there? In the uh, in the uh, wheel wells of the B fifty twos. The snakes did. from yes, from Thailand. Uh, when the B fifty twos back uh, were flying and landing in around uh, the, the bases there in Thailand, the snakes would crawl up in the wheel wells. When they come back to Anderson Air Force Base, they'd Guam, come out. They'd come out, <laughs> and that's what brought them there. And uh, we did, wow. they, we're, they were a big like problem. Deboarding now, all the all snakes leave the wheel wells. Now, what are they going to do yeah. with all those, those those mice that have no headaches? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which means they have sex all the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're going to be really. <laughs> Is, is that an FCC? No, never. That is amazing. You can't say sex. Oh, that's right. I'll take that back. <laughs> but but if you got time, I do have a really really yes, we really really time. funny story. Yeah. This was I was in the, in Iran, the Far East, for a couple of years, two years actually, in Tehran. And we were taking over the radio TV station from the Army, which was dedicating at that time a lot of its energies towards Vietnam. Mm. But at that time, the military advisory group in Iran was the second largest next to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were providing, uh, meaning the Air Force training uh, and uh, 
the the Shaw's mm-hmm. pilots and maintenance people there, even though they'd already been through the pilot school. So we had a radio and TV station and uh, pumped a lot of money in it. Our headquarters was in Wiesbaden in Germany. But uh, uh, we had... We were inside the Iranian motor pool, so we had security around that. And also, coming in, there were Iranian guards who would wave us through. And one evening, after I signed off, I was going home about midnight, and we, we still kept people in there. I left the station, turned and was going toward the gate, and there was an Iranian guard with his weapon mm-hmm. in a, just pointing right at me. And, you know, so I stopped the vehicle, don't move, kept my hands on the wheel, and... Another guard came up and knocked and, you know, asked for identification. So I gave the identification, and the guy never moved. And for the longest time, I just kind of waited. What's going to happen here? Is this the revolution? <laughs> and as it turned out, they waved me on through. So after they had someone from the embassy come up and explain what was going on, this, these guys work here. It's an American radio and TV station. So anyway, they established this. What they did, they took pictures of all the announcers and their families with their automobiles. And put them in the guard shack, the Iranian guard shack, <laughs> right. so that when any of us came up there, they would look, oh, okay, we've come through. So we had a guy, Bart Zarconi, who was a professional clown. <laughs> and and, he, and, and he, he did, now you can, you, you can imagine what happened. He would put on his makeup. He would do a kid show on Saturday morning. We had the little cartoons and stuff and everything. So Bart would do his makeup at home. His wife would help him with it. So he was in makeup as Zarconi the Clown <laughs> when he came through the gate. And this was right after they had taken the pictures. So they wind up stopping him. And, you know, and the embassy people show up, and they're shaking their hands. And we finally realize the reason they stopped him. And the pictures they took were with Polaroid black and white. <laughs> right. So the guard said, he has a blue car. This is a... A, a gray car. <laughs> right. So not because we, he was dressed as a clown. Not because he was dressed <laughs> as a clown. <laughs> yeah, the clown is in the wrong <laughs> car. Well, it's like Amazing. I've always said, the Air uh, Force is just full of clowns. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's a clown That's show. That's right. Yeah, and, and a clown and car. I'm proud of it. That's true. <laughs> but you know going what through uh, two transitions, I actually got out, took a break in service in 65, uh, came back here, worked at the station. Went back in uh, about a year later and then retired. So I went through two transitions as a, as a first enlistee getting out, making that transition, and then retiring. And I'm not sure which one was the toughest as mm-hmm. far as making that transition because regardless of how much you look forward to getting out and going yep. back to civilian life, you miss it. I mean, there's something about the camaraderie and everything oh, yeah. there. Yeah. In the military, but uh, retiring, well, you know that's permanent. That's yeah. you're not yeah. going back. Well, no, you know, I'm you're not getting back. Curious, and and one of the one of the thoughts and <clears throat> questions that Brad had wrote down is, you know, really, how did your your we, let me back up a little bit. We think about job skills like it's really hard to transition artillery, you know, training yeah. mm-hmm. into civilian you know, workplace, right? We're not really blowing stuff up. Yes, we got to keep inventory. We got to move equipment. We got to maintain stuff. There's lots of different skill sets that transition. But in a big picture, those two things just don't really go side and side, you know, civilian and military occupations. But thinking about, you know, being a broadcaster, how did your time in service as a broadcaster inform you to be a broadcaster in civilian life? How, Well, it's pretty similar. The only difference between American Forces Radio and Television Service and WSIC and other radio stations are commercials. Right. That's it. I mean, we we do everything. We play records. We have uh, uh, the same equipment and stuff. I mean, obviously, it's changed a lot, I'm sure, now the 35 years I've been away from it. But uh, one interesting thing, when I, when I did bring my 214 here to the station, Bob Marlowe was our station manager. This was 1965. And uh, I gave him a 214. He was Army. And he's looking at it. And I, I was separated early. I got what is called an early out because there was not enough the time to reassign me from coming back from overseas to uh, Travis Air Force Base, mm-hmm. where I was being discharged. Because you have to have at least more than six months. And I had about four months remaining in about four years. So they on the D, uh, DD 214, it said, convenience of the government. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob Marlowe is looking at this 214. He said, 
what is convenience of the government? <laughs> yeah. Why was it convenient yeah. for them to get you out of there? <laughs> yeah, normally it's more convenient for them to keep you than it <laughs> yeah. is for them to uh, get you out. But that, that was kind of weird and strange there. But you know, you, you hear about the 214s now. If you go and make sure you have your 214 registered with the Register of Deeds office, yeah. there are several merchants now around the area that will give you a discount. And at the Register of Deeds office, there's a card. I'm not sure if it's a mini 214 or if it's a special card that with certain merchants in the area, Interesting. in addition to like Lowe's, you know, will give us right, a right. Uh, There are others that will give you a discount or a special consideration for your time in service with that. So if you haven't registered your 214, folks, guys, gals, make sure you have that done and get that little ID card. If you've already registered, go over there and get the little ID so card. A curious question uh, before we go to our next commercial break here. In in the process of your transition, did you know that you wanted to stay in radio? Was it was it kind of planned for you that you were going to come to WSIC or, or a station? Ironically, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I uh, when I retired, I knew I was going to go in broadcasting. When I that, that's basically really all I knew I wanted to do, and I had big plans. I was going to wind up in Los Angeles doing some morning drive time, making lots of money. So much uh, better. But being I wound here. up here. To, you know, I loved it here, <laughs> and decided got married, had a little kid on the way, and the yeah. recruiter called me at the right time and said, "You know, we can pay for that baby. <laughs> we'll get that baby paid for." But. Uh, uh, upon retiring, I came back and applied for a civil service job. And guess where I wound up? Army recruiting at the uh, detachment in the, or the the, the uh, well, what do they call not the brigade? The brigade was down in Georgia. Uh, whatever the battalion, was, the battalion, yeah. the yeah. battalion, recruiting battalion in Charlotte. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So I was with the advertising publicity group. That's awesome. There's a civilian really GS nine cool. and. Uh, Liked yeah. it. It was All right. Good. Well, we'll get a roll to a commercial Uh-oh. break. We'll be back in three minutes with putting the pieces back together and Pat Shannon. All right. Welcome back to putting the pieces back together, presented by Purple Heart Homes, and we are here with Air Force veteran, uh, broadcast extraordinaire Pat legend. Shannon, the legend, yeah. the legend yeah. himself, the man, the myth, the legend. Oh, sure. Every Jesus. man's envy, every woman's desire. <laughs> I can't. I, I don't even know why I'm here, but I, I, I really for, for, because I, you know, I listen to your program. I have never missed one of your episodes. Oh, bless your of heart. This. Even when you were You're only a, yourself. when you were only a half hour. And yeah. remember, you Before messed up so fired. much. We made you come to an hour. Yeah, yeah and we said right. if you mess this up, it's going to be two hours. <laughs> I know. Well, this is episode but seventy-nine. I love the today. program and the guest whom you have. I mean, they're yeah. wonderful stories, great yeah. stories, and and I get I've I've actually been choked up too on some of the the, been the, good. the situations I've heard and, and the transitions the guys yeah. have made. It's just unbelievable. Well, it's a great show. We're fortunate to have you. Well, we're really well, glad to be been, here, yeah. and it's been good for us uh, just being able to uh, meet and connect with some new folks. And you know, truly, I, I think it's beyond just helping the community understand their their role and responsibility in reintegrating vets, but um, it helps us to know that as veterans, we're not alone, right? Yeah, for that sure. our experiences yeah. are not necessarily always unique. While the circumstances might be unique, the overall experience, yeah. uh, you know, there there's some commonality. Yeah, a lot of common ground. I know as a little kid uh, growing up in the 70s here in Statesville, WSIC was what everybody listened to. Um, I used to listen to the top 40 records that were played on here, and I remember as a kid going, Wow, it would be really cool to have a radio program. <laughs> I mean, I, I, like I'm, I'm no, when people say, people program. say, how you doing? I'll go, I'm living the dream, yep. right? And I'm, I'm, I'm on the radio every week, and I can't believe it. You know, it's what I thought about when I was a little kid. So uh, I'm really glad to be here and glad to be, glad to be advocating for veterans um, every Tuesday on WSIC. So uh, we're really gl- grateful, and we're so glad that you're here. And I want to talk about. Um, the Home Ad Show, which is um, um, for those that are listening, maybe on Spotify or watching on YouTube and you're not from our area. The Home Ad Show in Statesville, North Carolina is a staple, right? And it has been around for 40 years. And wow. so I want to yeah, so tell us a little bit about what is the Home Ad Show um, and how did it come about and what was it? What's the genesis behind it? That's the hardest question to ask. I'm, I'm asked that's the hardest for me to answer yeah. because I really don't know what it is. Right. I mean, I've thought about it. It actually goes back to as far back as 1950 because I was kind of researching over in the library uh, some old record landmark issues, and I came on a, a radio schedule. 
and they have it like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the trading post, the tra- for 15 minutes. <laughs> right. So it goes back. In 1965, it, when, when I got out of the Air Force and came back here, it was on from 6.30 until 7. Then we started the Top 40 stuff at 7 right. o'clock at night till sign-off. And um, so I did that, that then, the home ad. Then I went back in the Air Force, came back. It was moved to 9 o'clock for an hour. It used to be like radio bingo, and then they changed it to home ad. But what we discovered is that there is a need for it out there. There are people that uh, uh, are, have things they, they want to try to maybe convert to cash or they don't need them anymore or they're looking for They can't quite afford a new mower or a new wedge whacker or setup, and they're wanting to get a good deal. Or they just want to uh, talk to somebody. Yeah. And you find that a lot, too. Yeah, and it's so uh, different and, from there's so yeah. many things out there with the Internet. There's the, you know, the Facebook marketplace. Oh, sure. If you want to exactly. buy and sell something, um, I think what's unique about the Home Ad Show <laughs> is the people that call in. Right. Yep. That, that's what makes it great. That's what makes the show great. And you got some you got some callers that are regulars, right? Yes, yes we got, do. He's got callers that call in during our show waiting for him <laughs> yeah. to get on the yeah. air. Hey, y'all get off the air. I'm wanting to talk to Pat, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that's right. Yeah, that can get a little embarrassing. And yeah. then after we're off the air, they'll call and talk to Jeff or Mickey Sawyer. And... <laughs> can you give me the number of that guy that had the... <laughs> that's right. Tell, what's the most book? interesting thing, as, as you look back, wow. uh, the most interesting thing that somebody called in to sell? or buy on Gosh. the show. Can you remember anything that just kind of stands out? Well, Brad, it's uh, because it's like every day <laughs> every, when you hit that button, it's right, going to be a know. new surprise. You never know. <laughs> and uh, we've had houseboats on. Mm-hmm. We've had, uh, of course, farm animals of all kinds. We've <laughs> right. had <there. laughs> and, and, uh, and, and houses. I got and, a goat that I need to get rid of. <laughs> fading, <Yeah>. fading goats <laughs> yeah, and all that goats. stuff. The only thing Has we anybody will ever not... tried to sell their spouse on? I, 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 we, we have a disclaimer. <laughs> you know, if you've got some useless thing around the house that serves no purpose, spouse is not included. <laughs> you can call it. <laughs> we've had, to, we've had that try. Uh, that's incredible. We we, yeah. we did have it. Was, it's kind of a, a sad one. One of our callers who had been calling in for a while, another caller called me just before we were starting home ad to let me know she had passed on. Hmm. And I said, "Are you sure?" I said, "I, I, I was." kind of check the obituaries for two reasons. If I'm not in there, then I can come in and do home That's right. But yeah. to see if there might be somebody that, uh, as I you know, get older, there are more people I know now that are passing on. Well, anyway, so I did a little kind of a, you know, a tribute to her. And um, sorry, you know, well, two callers later, there she is. Pat, I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm not even sick. It's like a Andy Griffith episode. That's right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You're not? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, well, I was gone, but now I'm not. Well, That's once right. you're gone, you're gone. You can't come back. It just mm. ain't decent. That's <laughs> right. No, you're sorry. You're, you're gone. That is amazing. That, 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 that was one of the most embarrassing moments. Of right. Life, so, uh, <laughs> from then on, I've never, you know, never trust the callers there. Because yeah. there was someone by the same name that had passed away there. But eventually she did pass on. Yeah. And stuff. But her husband called in for quite a while after that. And, um, uh, but it's a, it's an amazing program and it's like family. Yeah. And during the, and let's, let's see, when I, 85 was what, 33 years ago? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. When I retired and came back and, uh, so during that period of time, I've lost a lot of my family. Mm. I've lost my pets. Yeah. And uh, the easiest way I've found to deal with that was to actually go on the air, to be yeah. with the family, with, to be with home ad. Right. And it's like, and, and John's like me. It's hard when we get into a very emotional uh, thing we're saying to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, when you were reading the passage about the Japanese in uh, D-Day invasion, it, it's very, it, it'll, it'll, it'll affect me and I can't talk very well. Mm. So I have to stop for a minute and, get, and gather myself and then I can talk about it. And, and losing my family, uh, my mom, my dad and all during, it was pretty rough. And then my pets yeah. that, that had been part of Home Ed, they were mascots and stuff. But I'm able to get through it. And in fact, just recently, we lost our little Bichon mm. about three weeks ago. Oh, so that's uh, brutal. Uh, and in fact, Justin, our soon-to-be new owner, whom we're training as right. best we can, hey, he said, "You don't have to do the show." I said, "Yes, I do. Yeah, I yeah. really need to be on the air." It's thing. therapy, right? It's so therapy. In, the, in the you know, with the with technology the way it is, and 
you know, this is um, this forum is a very old school forum. Yeah. You know, radio has mm -hmm. been around for you know 100 years. Um, what what do you see? I mean, I think, you know, the more things change, sometimes the more things stay the same. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think that there's there's a, a specific need. And I just heard this the other day that that um, Ford is no longer going to put AM radios in cars. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um, and w what do you think the future is for broadcast radio, like what we're doing and like what you do? What, mm -hmm. what does the future hold? Is there are we going to come? Are we going to have a time where this is no longer a thing or is this going to be one of those things that that just holds on because of the connectivity uh, and how it, you know people are brought together because of it. The the technology to me is just it's like every every week there's something new there's something yeah. there that 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 uh, Isaiah is telling me about or that's happening in this the the uh, blogging that's going on that you see the uh, Facebook uh, having us on TV. Yeah. Uh, but I think the biggest difference and I think the biggest positive is that you're finding more and more people doing radio shows and doing different type of internet that is really, really more entertaining than back in the day when the only time you could go on radio was you have these oval tones and this right. great, that was the prerequisite. Mm -hmm. And so we missed out a lot of good talent out there, people that had a lot of good things to do and could do great shows just because they didn't have that great so-called radio voice. Yeah. But now that doesn't matter, I mean, because you have shows where you've got... Uh, the the content and what people are putting out there and t telling you about, I think, is a lot, yeah, a I mean, lot better. Really interesting, Pat. Just a couple of thoughts there. You know, I think laughter is good medicine, right? Oh, it's definitely good and, medicine. And just, yep. to, you know, on the point of what uh, Brad's, you know, saying and, you know, kind of where is that going to change in some of these shows? I mean, so many, so many different shows and uh, particularly the, you know, our, our friends down uh, at, at uh, I Heart, Woody and Wilcox, uh -huh. they bring a lot of laughter, right? <laughs> yeah, every and, day. And, I mean, yeah. yeah, every day every for day. hours on end and uh, just uh, really being able to help people somewhat, um, I hate the term of disconnect, but really reconnect their mind into a happy oh, yeah. place for maybe what's bothering them. But there's something you said that I, I want to draw out. And that is the, this idea of how when you're going through something that's created sorrow in your life, mm -hmm. being on the air and, and broadcasting and, and sharing that information, talking about it, how mm -hmm. that helps you, right? Yep. But I think it also helps the listener to know that they're not alone, that they're mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. going through something, right? And and so this connectivity of emotions through the airwaves and and I, I just wish that more people would would not be so afraid to talk about that pain. Sure, that that too. they would realize that's something that can help them get through it. I, I was talking with a young man uh, just yesterday, and how he, um, you know, just emotionally closed himself off from everybody, right? And so he he's got these challenges in in life, and he doesn't feel like he's got anybody to talk to. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's the worst place we can mm -hmm. be. And I've I've come to share with with folks uh, more and more that Purple Heart Homes is not just building houses. We're we're truly saving lives. It's about letting people know that we see them, we hear them and that they matter. Right. And that is fighting that you know epidemic of suicide. I mean, some mm -hmm. days the, we're, we not only help veterans with uh, their housing, but we go to the vet with them. Yeah, we that's go right. To, go to the veterinarian mm -hmm. with them because their cat is sick. So yeah. that, that happened mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. So that was but awesome. those are only for special assignments for the <laughs> chaplain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we will never we will never send right. Mangum to yeah. the to the Mangum never to the veterinarian <laughs> to help with the cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> that is for sure. I think one of the things about, um, and, and especially about the Home Ad Show, um, it's very unique. It's just not, um, it's not, it's not something that you can pull up on any radio show just anywhere. Um, but the great thing about, for me, about technology now is that when, back in 1975, when I was listening to radio as a 10-year-old mm -hmm. kid, if you missed it, you missed it. Yep. Right. You didn't. There was no way to go back. Right. And now the wonderful thing is, is that because everything is recorded, yep. if you miss an episode live, you can go back and watch it any time or listen to it any time on all these platforms and everything. And so if people miss the home ad show live on WSIC coming through their radio. They can go back on Facebook and watch it live and pick that thing up and that weed whacker or that yeah, fainting that's, goat that's that was amazing. for sale. I found it on YouTube. 
Yeah. Just yeah, kind of right. there it was on YouTube. Yeah, on snippets YouTube. And stuff. Didn't even know you were out Didn't there, Didn't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking, <laughs> speaking of goats, we closed on a house here recently. <laughs> right, right, we did. And, and we, we built a house for a veteran. We we went and did all the paperwork with the with the lawyer. And, and I'm, I'm, I get a phone call as I'm getting ready to go to the lawyer's office. And, and, they, and the phone calls the veteran. He says, hey, uh, look, I've got a problem. We were getting in the truck and, uh, to go to the lawyer's office. And uh, lo and behold, we look out in the field and there's a new kid. I'm thinking... Did it just wander up? I mean, is it the neighbor's kid? What <laughs> right, is it? He's like, right. oh, no, no, no. Our, our goat had a baby. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, don't worry about the goat. Get to the lawyer's office. This is scheduled. You don't yeah, miss a lawyer's right. appointment that's in closing. Right. Yeah. And it, so so the veteran says, all right, mama, grab the kid and get in the truck and let's go. <laughs> they, they brought the goat to the closing. Did they, they really? Yeah. They, they brought really the, goat, the goat was in the truck with them. <laughs> oh An gosh. actual live <laughs> man goat. In the truck at the closing. So the receptionist held the held the baby goat oh, while yep. we signed all the papers. Yeah. It's incredible. And yes. and then she was like, "I don't want you to take it with you. Can yeah. you just leave it the rest of the day?" Well, there's nothing like if you are if you are down in this world and you you know and sorrowful, just pull up on the internet for baby goats mm -hmm. and just watch videos about baby goats and life will be better for you. Or baby old goats. goats. If you want an old goat, tune right. in the whole man. I'm well, that's <laughs> true. That's true. Yeah. Old goats or young goats. Old goats. Yeah. Mares eat oats and dozy goats. Right? Hey, uh, and little uh, lambsy dabby. Dabby. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you had a uh, interesting story you shared with us uh, earlier as before we got on the show. Uh, just real quick, we start to wrap up. Yep. Your dad was a... A farrier. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, a farrier, but he was also a sheriff in Monroe. Well, no, he was the chief of police. Chief of police. Chief of police in Monroe, and uh, actually ran for sheriff and got the bumps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and oh, wow. they were pretty pretty bad, so that's yeah, why yeah, he... So, for those that don't know what a farrier is, that's somebody who shoes horses. horses. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that's how long ago it was when the Army still had a bunch of horses. That's right. But who shoeing? was it that worked for him? Jesse Helms Sr., Senator Helms' dad yes. was uh, assistant chief of police, and when dad left, he became uh, the chief of police there in Monroe after dad left, but uh, he worked with... In fact, when uh, Jesse Sr. died, uh, my dad was still living, and we went there, and uh, the senator came in from... And we went there to the funeral, and there was Senator Helms, who knew my dad, and... and uh, he was quite uh, quite congenial and friendly. He remembered my dad and stuff. That's and really cool. A that's, that's a neat story. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse Helms. A lot of local a, history. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's a famous, famous senator from our state. <laughs> so. Now, yep. in For infamous in some Infamous cases. to, to yeah, many, some cases, many folks, so. but yeah, had well, quite a career. You yeah. knew where he stood. On yeah, that, oh, yeah. Mr. Very, no, senator No, I think they yeah, call yeah, it. Senator No, that's senator exactly no. right. I remember that. So, uh, well, we're drawing close to the end of the show. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, I know, Pat. It's oh, been a, it's been lovely having you here, and uh, we want you to come back again because we've got a treasure trove of stories that need to be told that haven't been told. And so, hey, please listen to Pat Shannon uh, coming up at nine a.m. nine o five a.m. for the Home Ad Show and buy and sell, and yeah. maybe you can find a fainting goat. Or so, so I just got a text message from one of our listeners that that I, I think is important for us to note that. Uh, John hasn't tanked ratings today, as you oh. implied earlier. <laughs> but they said that Ford reverses the course and decides to keep the AM hey, radio in vehicle. Right, AM radio. Hey, so all we go. Right. All right. Victory. Hey, we'll see y'all next week on putting the pieces back together. <laughs>Have been listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together with John Galena and Brad Borders. Join us again next Tuesday at 8 a.m. and Saturday at 5 p.m. for Putting the Pieces Back Together on News Talk WSIC.